I am the pastor of Family Ministries here at Cornerstone Community Church. And just like to say welcome. Welcome to everybody that's here uh, in person, everybody that's joining us online today. Uh, we're very glad to have you. Uh, make sure that you grab those cards that you had to move out of the way and sit down. Fill that card out and drop it in the bucket when it comes around. If you're our first time guest this morning, uh, hang on to that card. And on your way out, stop by the Connection Center in the foyer, turn that card in, and we have a gift just for you to let you know how much we appreciate you coming today. Um, tonight, very special, we have a community revival that will be taking place uh, next door at Union Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, it begins at 7 p.m. We have five different area churches that are coming together to ask God for revival in our community. So um, join the body of Christ as we point people to Jesus together in this area. Um, it's time to start planning for the children's Christmas program. If you'd like more information about that, please see Michelle Kennedy um, and get your kids signed up for that. Uh, are you ready to take the next step in becoming a covenant partner here at Cornerstone Community Church? Uh, our next covenant partner class will be held on Saturday, December the 7th from 9 a.m. to 12.30. The class covers our divisions, values, and structures of CCC. Uh, if you have any questions or anything just about Cornerstone, what we're about, uh, that's the time. Come, come and join that class. Uh, you can sign up for events or get more information um, on CCC from our website at c2churchrm.com, or you can check us out on Facebook, or just look at the weekend update that you got when you came in. Um, you can find out about everything going on and sign up for different events with your connection card. Uh, all right, that's all the business. Now let's get down to worshiping Jesus together. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Morning. So when you woke up this morning, did you just wake up praising God, knowing that you're going to come into his house this morning and lift up all of your praise? Amen. Yeah. That's where we need to be. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to just lift up our praise to Him this morning. Because the Bible tells us if we don't praise Him, if we don't give Him our praise, the rocks are going to growl. I don't want the rocks in the driveway to be louder than we are with y'all. Yeah, let's see what we can do about that this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much. And we thank you for this incredible day that you've given us to come into your house, God. We pray that everything that we say and everything that we do in this place will bring you much honor, glory, and fame this morning because you alone are worthy. Father, we ask you to, to join us. We, we invite you into our presence, Father. We just pray that you will move among us and do with us as you will. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. And all God's children said. Amen. Amen.
Christ. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, by the way, is the appropriate response when we encounter grace. We just can't help but to shout to the Lord and just glorify Him because we realize He's done for us what we can never do for ourselves.
Oh 
Jesus Christ and praise this morning.
Um, please keep in mind that this is not an indication that our worship is ending. For you see in his word that we are called to give of our time, our talents, and our time. A small token of appreciation for all that he has blessed us with. the biggest shout you got.
this out so well. I should have had somebody grab this one. <laughs> I got to collect myself emotionally just a second. That is a powerful expression of how God molds us and makes us. You know, there's there's no finished products here in this room. We're all being molded by our Savior, and that's a beautiful thing to think that He would do what he does in our lives to create a masterpiece. You, you might not feel like a masterpiece. In fact, in many days, I feel like a cartoon. But in God's eyes, in God's eyes, I'm a masterpiece every time. You know, if you take a Stradivarius violin, and put it in the hands of a beginner. It's not going to sound very good, is it? But if you take that same set of errors and put it in the hands of a master, it can make the most beautiful music that you'll ever hear. It's the same with our lives. If we'll take this life that God has given us, and we'll put it in the hands of the master. We can make beautiful music with your life. It's all about the master's hands. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1 as our text this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. And I'm going to ask that you stand as we read this word together. Uh, it is going to be on the screen as it always is, and I want to invite you all to join me in reading this aloud. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you so very much for your presence here right now. And Lord, I pray that as we spend these moments in your word, Father God, may we just, uh, just hear your voice speaking to us. And Lord, like what we just witnessed, Father, with the, 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 the potter's hand, I pray that you'd use this word to form us and make us into who you want us to be so that we can declare your glory to a looking world. Holy Spirit, would you empower me right now to speak your word Lord, I can't do anything apart from you. So Holy Spirit, you come and you do in and through me whatever it is you want to do. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So far in Colossians, we've already seen that the cosmic fullness of Christ is evident. He's the one who created and now sustains the universe by His might. We've also seen the implications of His fullness for every area of life. He is Lord, and He is supreme over all. Now we're going to see how His fullness for the most intimate of relationships that we have on planet Earth, those within our households. Today we're going to discover that Jesus is supreme over our most intimate relationships. It is true 
that God's way is the way to a healthy household. Do you believe that, church? God's way is the way for a healthy household. Now, when I read that passage of Scripture, maybe if some of you had already read last week ahead a little bit and you saw this passage of Scripture, some of you probably thought, oh my goodness, i got to be at church next Sunday because I want to see how we're going to deal with this. I want to give you two caveats before we spend some time unpacking this, this powerful text that, that provides for us God's way to experience Christ's fullness in our homes. The first one is that we must not read our culture into Paul's culture. You see, if we do, we're not going to hear this text because we're going to be angered by it and we're going to dismiss it outright. The idea is we try to find the timeless truth in the text and reapply it into our culture. You know, I'm going to give you some background on the culture in Paul's day. You see, in Paul's day, women... Children and slaves were considered property. They had zero rights. And so here we hear Paul addressing those in power and those who were under power. And I cannot tell you how earth-shattering that would have been to a first century ear. For Paul to even address a wife, for Paul to address children, or for Paul to address slaves... It would have been unthinkable in the ancient world because they were considered to be nothing more than possessions. They weren't even worth a mention. And so Paul here, in our day when we hear this text, we're thinking he's diminishing women. He's diminishing children. And and certainly we we don't have any conception of slavery because we can't conceive of any way that that is right. And so if we're reading our mindset into this text, we're going to completely miss what Paul's saying here because, in fact, Paul is not diminishing women. He's not diminishing um, children. He's not, he's not advocating slavery. No, he is turning it on its ear and saying those that are under that authority are people that God created and deeply loves. And we need to treat them as we would want to be treated. The second caveat that I I want to give you is this. We must understand that just because the Bible describes something, it doesn't mean it's endorsing it or prescribing it. In Paul's day, there were an estimated estimated 33 million slaves in the Roman Empire. No doubt every household that Paul was writing to had slaves in that household. Now, note what he's saying here. He is not saying that slavery was fitting in the Lord like he had said about women submitting to their husbands. Or he didn't say that it pleased the Lord as he did when children submitted to their fathers. He doesn't say that about slavery. And that in and of itself is a subtle rebuke to the institution of slavery. Something else that you need to realize is this letter, the Colossian letter, was also joined with the letter of Philemon. If you have read the letter of Philemon, you understand that Paul's writing the letter to Philemon on behalf of a slave, Onesimus, who had fled from Philemon's household. He fled and Paul encountered him, led him to the Lord, and now he's a brother in Christ and now he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon with this letter. And in that letter, Paul is saying, receive him back as a brother in Christ. And if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. See, these two letters would have been traveling together. And so you add the letter to Philemon to what Paul says here about, you understand, this is a rebuke of the institution of slavery. But what he is doing is he's saying, those of you that are under that institution, there is a way that you can live that will glorify God, even in the midst of that injustice. What Paul does in this text is he gives instructions for a godly household. And you know, if we're going to have households that reflect the glory of God we got to do it God's way. Amen? The fullness of Christ that we've seen in creation, 
the fullness of Christ in every segment of our culture and society, that same fullness must be present in our homes if we're going to have households that are glorifying God. You know, first Paul deals with the, the wife-husband relationship. Verses 18 and 19, we read this, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh to them. Speaking first to the wives, he tells them that they are to submit. Now, that word submit has fallen on hard times in our culture. In our culture, when we hear the word submit, it's kind of an ugly word, isn't it? It's as if we're being subjugated. But you see, the biblical definition of that word submit, it actually pictured a voluntary ordering under of one under the authority of another. And Paul says for wives to do this to husbands is fitting in the Lord. Headship for men is established in Genesis. Notice when, when God created Adam, He resigned, assigned him res specific responsibility for the creation. And then when Eve is created, God places them in that garden and God is the head Adam is underneath, and now he is the head of the woman, which is Eve. God's idea was that Adam was to follow Christ, and as he followed Christ, Eve was to follow his godly example and submit to his headship. Now, I want you to understand, when we talk about headship, we're not talking about worth. Adam was not worth more to God than Eve was. It's not about worth at all. It's about role. God assigned specific roles to Adam and He assigned specific roles to Eve. It's the same for us today. Men, God has assigned you a role in your household. You are to be the spiritual head of your household. That's your role. It's your responsibility to make sure that the people within your household are coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord. It's your job, men, to make sure your, your wife is being nurtured in her faith. It's your job, men, to make sure you're lifting up your house in prayer daily and pushing them toward the vision that God has for your household. That's your job. And see, our culture hears that and, and we're like, what in the world is this guy talking about? Everybody knows that, that church is, 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 is about women. You know, growing up in church, every teacher that I had growing up was a woman. I can't think of one male teacher that I had in Sunday school. This is a pregnant pause, by the way. I'm letting that settle. Because you see... That shouldn't be. Because what it tells me is us men, we've abdicated our responsibility. And you see, that's what got us in this mess to begin with, if you don't, if you don't get this. You know, God had, had said to Adam, you are, I'm looking to you, you're responsible. Now, when the, the snake comes and begins to speak to Eve, you know, Adam wasn't off naming stuff. According to the text, Adam was standing right there when the snake came up and started talking to Eve. And right there in that moment, he abdicated his headship. Because the minute that serpent started talking to his wife, he should have stepped in and said, Whoa, dude, slow your roll. You got something to say, talk to me. I'm the head. If you want to, if you want to talk to me, he should have stepped in and protected his wife from the spiritual evil that was assaulting her. Not because she was incapable of defending herself, but because he had been assigned that responsibility by God. You don't believe me? Look at chapter 3. When God comes to begin to, to talk to them about their, their sin, who does he address? He speaks to Adam because Adam was the one who was responsible. He didn't do that because he didn't know Eve's name. He's God, by the way. He knows. And it wasn't because he didn't know what happened. He's God. He already knows. No, he spoke to Adam because it was Adam's responsibility. And because he abdicated his responsibility, here we are in the messed up world in which we live. Men, we have been given that responsibility by God. And when we 
walk in that headship. Wives, according to the scripture, you should submit to that headship. That doesn't diminish your worth. That doesn't make you weak. No, it makes you godly. It gives that your husband the support that he needs to bear the weight of the responsibility. You know, as a man in this room, I really wish God had given you women the responsibility of headship. I would gladly order myself right up under you. and let you, Because that's basically what we've been doing by default anyway, isn't it? In our households and in the church. The reality is that Wives, we are, you are to submit to your husbands a voluntary ordering under the authority of that headship. Now, one caveat, and this is a big one. You are to submit unless that husband is telling you to do something that violates God's Word. You do not submit to an ungodly request. And that's true of any Submission. If our government passes an immoral law, it's our job as Christians to civilly disobey that rule, correct? I mean, it's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king said, when the, you hear the horn blown, everybody's going to bow down to an image of my statue. And they couldn't do it because they knew there was only one God in heaven that they were supposed to worship. And so when the horn blew, what did they do? Everybody else bowed. They stood up. They stood out. See, that's what God wants for our families, by the way, our households. He, he wants them to stand out. He wants them to be remarkable. So when people are looking that don't know Christ, they see something in our household, a, a presence of God, a joy that, that the world doesn't have. And see, this is the path toward it when we men step up and be the head and wives, you submit. You know... The fact is, when Paul addresses the husband next and he says, love your wives, and in the Ephesians passage, he actually adds to it, as Christ loves the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. And do not be harsh to them. I can't tell you how big of a bombshell that would have been to Paul's original li listeners. Remember, women or wives were property in Paul's day. They had no rights. In fact, a lot of times... <coughs> Excuse me. The, the women wouldn't even live in the same house with the men. They would have their own quarters somewhere and the husband would beckon them into his presence when he wanted them. They literally were property. And love was not necessary in a first century marriage. It was more convenient and to keep the family line going. Love was not a prerequisite for marriage. And here Paul is saying, don't just dwell with your wives. Love them. And love them as Christ loved the church. That's huge. Because you see, I want to ask you ladies something. If you've got a husband that loves you like Christ loved the church and gave his life for that church, you know, that means your husband is willing to lay his life down for you. And not just, you know, pushing you out of the way if you're about to get hit by a bus. He's daily laying his life down, wanting you to, to become everything God created you to be. And He's serving and doing everything He can to lift you up because He's loving you like Christ loved the church. Would any of you in this room have a problem in this world submitting to a head like that? I didn't think so. I've been preaching this thing for 20-some years and I've never had a woman yet say, yeah, I, I object to this whole... You know, our culture would object to this simply because it thinks it's demeaning. No. The idea of a husband loving his wife as Christ loved the church is the most lifting thing that you'll encounter because that love always lifts. He then moves on and he addresses the next coupling in the household, children and fathers. Verses 20. In 21, he says this, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Children are to obey their parents in everything. 
That means children are supposed to respect the authority of their parents because that pleases the Lord. Again, same caveat. If, if your parents are telling you to do something that's, that's ungodly or against the Word of God, you are to not submit to that. You are supposed to stay faithful to the Lord. But if your parents are, are loving you and supporting you, because see, I get it. I used to be a kid too many moons ago. You know, I didn't re- I mean, I thought my parents were incredibly dumb. Anybody else in here think that growing up? You know, when I was probably 8, 9, 10, and especially when I got about 12, 13, 4, I thought my parents were the dumbest people on the planet. I mean, really, I thought they were just completely dumb. Amazing to me how smart and how much knowledge they, they gained when I turned about 20. I mean, these people that were dumb as bricks, next thing you know, they're the smartest people I know. I'm like, when did that happen? And you know what? The Lord said, you idiot, they've always been smart. It was you that was dumb. That's the truth. You know, and as children, mature, maturity, we don't know what we don't know. That's, that's the definition of immaturity. You don't know what you don't know. In the household, parents, children, you're supposed to respect your parents and everything and, and, and follow the, the God that they're giving you because they truly do love you and they truly do have your best interest at heart. They truly do know a little bit more about life than you do. They used to be young too. They made some dumb mistakes growing up. And so they're trying to nurture you and teach you to learn from their mistakes. Now, in addressing fathers, and again, this is the bombshell. He says to fathers, don't provoke your children lest they be discouraged. Now, as I said, children in this day, they were like property. Do you know you could, put to, you could legally put a child to death for disobedience? That's another pregnant Paul, so I'm letting that hang. Yeah, parents, you could actually take one out. You know, and I, I've al- always wanted to say to my kids, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. Legally, I can't do it, but in Paul's day, oh boy, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. You know, Paul says, don't have that kind of relationship with your children. See them as gifts from God. You realize that that children are a gift from God, right? They are a gift. They are a precious treasure that God has entrusted you with. And He wants you to experience the joy of knowing what it's like to be a parent, like to understand what He feels like when He looks at you. See, I often have to remind myself that as a dad. The same way that I'm looking at my child right now is the same way God looks at me. I mean, God must look at me sometimes and say, what in the world were you thinking? And in what universe did you think that was going to work out right? But He loves me. And He seeks to lift me out of my, my discouragement and give me a life that's filled with joy. And happiness. Fathers are supposed to provide that for their kids. Today, we got too many absentee fathers in the home. Dads, this isn't beat up dad Sunday. This isn't beat up men day at Cornerstone. You know, there are too many dads that are, are so busy making a living that they're not living a life. You know, in, in our day today, we've got such a, a, a drive to provide more. You know, we think that what, what we're supposed to do as dads is provide a good living for our household so our kids can have the things that we didn't have when we grew up. And we think in doing that, we're putting them forward or helping them out. You know what your kids really need more than, more than stuff? They need you. They need you in their lives. They need you beside them, helping them figure out the, the ups and downs of life. They need you to tell them what's going, what's going on with life and how, how, the, how things are going to change as they grow. Dads, your kids need you. And while I'm here, let me address one more thing. Parents, your children do not need you to be their friend. They need you to be that authority figure in their life that shows them right from
from wrong. There'll be a time when you can be your child's friend. You know, I've got a daughter now that's married and she's established her own household with her husband. And I enjoy the friendship that I have developed with my daughter. The relationship has shifted a little. Now, she's still my daughter. I'm still daddy. And she's still my little girl. But now when we talk, sometimes I sit back and I hold the phone back and who is this woman talking to me? This is the same one who couldn't even chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. And hear this, she's speaking such wisdom. You know, I'm enjoying this phase of our relationship. But when your kids are growing up and you're nurturing them, your first priority is not to be their friend. I know way too many examples of parents who are so busy trying to be their kid's friend that they've abdicated their authority over that kid and that kid's running buck wild. And mom and dad are sitting there saying, well, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to be a parent. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to nurture them. You're supposed to help. You're supposed to discipline them. A father who loves his child disciplines his child. God really loves me, y'all. He does. He really loves me. Discipline is necessary for us to grow. And it's necessary for your children to grow up and be responsible human beings. You know, I have a theory. The reason we've got such little narcissists running around in our culture today is because we as parents have created them. We told them from, from day one that the whole world revolves around them. Our whole household revolves around them. And we've taught them that by our example and by what we do. And now when they leave our house, guess what they expect the whole world to do? To revolve around them. Well, let me tell you something, sunshine. The world could care less about revolving around you. If we think we're doing our kids a service and, and teaching them that, that they are the center, we are doing them a vast disservice. No. Children are supposed to obey their parents. And fathers, we're supposed to love our children and provide that covering for them. Wow, I'm late. This last section, slaves and master is one that we don't have a lot of connection for because we don't know this institution of slavery in our culture. Many preachers have tried to take the principles here and say, well, we'll, we'll make this about an employee-employer relationship. And I'm not going to do that this morning because, number one, I think we need to hear this as the original hearers would have heard it. We need to hear what Paul has to say about slave-master relationships because, again, you're going to see here, Paul was not pro-slavery. Paul was anti-slavery. But he's working within the confines of his culture to begin to move the needle, to, to deal with the injustice of one human being owning another. Does that even sound right to y'all? That one human being could own Another. That's reprehensible. Morally, ethically, in every sense of the word, it's reprehensible. But Paul says, for those that are in this institution, verse 22, bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that the Lord, from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Those are strong words, aren't they, to slaves? Notice the emphasis there. He's saying to them, find your dignity in who you are as a person under God. See, in Paul's culture... Slaves, now again, I told you women and children were considered property. Slaves were considered property, but even lower. They weren't even considered to have a soul. And they were considered to be mindless. Almost like, you know, a toaster. 
They were just an appliance that were to be used for your benefit. They didn't have any feelings, emotion. There was no personhood there. There was this idea that they were created in this condition to serve the strong. See how jacked up that is? That we can so dehumanize another human being that we can attach to them no significance whatsoever. Paul here is saying, look, if you find yourself as a slave, here's what you do. Obey everything from you know by everything obey in everything those who are your earthly masters not by eye service as people pleasers but with sincerity of heart in other words you have good character you work as you were are working unto the lord because see he's your ultimate master so what you do do for him serve that master that earthly master as you're serving the lord because that's who you are not because of who He is, but because of who you are. How many of you understand that people might do a lot to you on the outside, but they cannot touch the essence of who you are on the inside? And that's what Paul is saying. You have a worth, a dignity attached to your soul that your Creator put there. And an earthly master can't rob you of that. So you do what you do unto the Lord. And then he addresses masters. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Paul is saying to those masters, be careful. Because you know, the measure that you measure it out to the people under your authority is going to be measured back to you because God shows no partiality. The world might. The world might value people differently. See, that's really what this passage is about. Paul is assaulting a world that attaches value to people based upon their role. Husbands were more valuable than wives. Fathers were more valuable than children. Masters were more valuable than slaves. And Paul's turning it on its ear and he's saying, you've got a master in heaven who's over it all. And when he sees people, he sees just that, people. He doesn't make distinctions. It's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. That was the essential message that Paul wrote in that letter, Philemon, to Onesimus. Basically, about Anisimus, basically saying, we're now, this is your brother in Christ. Look at him, see him not as a slave, see him as a brother. So, quickly, what are the implications of all this for us? Number one, husbands are the thermostat in the house, not the thermometer. See, husbands, we're supposed to set the spiritual climate not just reflect it. Be a thermostat. Set the tone in your house. Don't be a thermometer merely registering what it's like there. Number two, husbands, wives, build a partnership in your home. Everybody know their role and respect each other. Look at your house as a partnership. Dad, Your only job is not to bring home the bacon. Mom, your only job is not just to fry it up in the pan. You know, y'all remember that song? Y'all remember that commercial? You know, the fact is, we're a partnership. Lisa and I are a partnership in our household. And, you know, sometimes I feel like she's the chairman of the board. And she should be, because she's much smarter than I am. The fact is, we are a partnership. And we should work together to make sure God's glory is exploding through our household. Fathers and moms, encourage your children. But be their parents, not their friends. And finally, the slave master thing. While we don't have a connection with that, we can learn something. The reality is we ultimately serve the Lord, not men. So we do what we do for Him. See, this passage of Scripture does speak to us today. 
it does tell us some things that can make our households reflect the glory of God. Because you really cannot improve on what God says in order to make your house the home that God wants it to be. Now, in this room right now, there is not a perfect family. Can I say amen to that? Can I hear that? Anybody think you've got a perfect family? We don't. We've got a mess, don't we? We've got some dysfunction, don't we? I mean, I feel like I live in dysfunction junction. How about you? We, we all have some dysfunction in our family systems. We all have that crazy uncle in our family, right? You know, you know that uncle, you go to the family reunion and you always have to duck that crazy uncle? Yeah, we've all got crazy in our system, amen? There's no perfect families in this room. There are no perfect parents in this room. You're going to make mistakes in raising your kids. You are. I've made a ton of mistakes. Thankfully, none of them have been terminal. Nobody died. Got dinged up a little bit, but nobody died. You know, there are no perfect husbands in this room. Wives, come on, there's your amen point. No perfect husbands. But guess what? There's no perfect wives either. There are certainly no perfect kids, right? We are all perfectly imperfect people that are in need of much grace. Can I get an amen? If you don't need grace in your household, come up here and teach. I'm going to sit down because I need a lot of grace in my house. But here's the deal. Our homes are never going to be what God wants them to be until we submit to the Lordship of Christ over that house. We got too much, we, too many of us turn to everything else to figure out how we're supposed to parent our kids rather than the Word of God. Too many of us husbands are listening to our egg-headed friends who've got five divorces for, for marital advice. Hint, don't ask the guy that has divorced five times for marriage advice. He has no clue. That's why he's divorced five times. Turn to the Word of God. Find out what God says makes for a happy wife and a happy marriage. Wives, instead of running your husband down to your friends, tell him, you know, I think he's really stupid. I really do. I mean, he can't, he can't chew gum and walk at the same time. I mean, in our culture, they, men are routinely made the butt of the joke. Look at, look at sitcoms on television. Men are routinely portrayed as knuckle draggers. The true smart people in the family are the wives, and the husbands are knuckle draggers. That's all they are. That's the caricature our culture has made. Wives, respect your husbands. Build him up. Buy him a book if he's dumb. Make him read. Do something. But just don't go down to the hairdresser and sit there with all the ladies with the, with the things on their head talking about how your husband's an idiot. Y'all didn't think I knew that, did you? I didn't think I knew what y'all did in that place, did you? See, that's why women have couches in their bathrooms. They go in there and sit, men, and talk about us. We don't have, a, we don't have that in this church. We, I said, no, we are not putting a couch in the bathroom because I ain't going to have women in there talking about their husbands. <laughs> Folks, if we want a happy household, it's God's way. God wants you to have that household that honors Him. No matter what state you find yourself in, do everything to glorify God. Let's raise the Lordship of Christ as supreme over our families. And let's, let's bring everything under His authority. How we treat each other, how we spend our money, everything under the authority of Christ. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're still going to have some struggle. You're still going to have days when people don't act like they should. You're still going to make mistakes. But you know what? The overall trajectory of your household as you form a partnership under the Lordship of Christ to try to make this household reflect the glory of God and found it on His Word, you're going to start feeling peace in your house like you've never felt before. Because you cannot improve on what God says in His Word. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe it, church? See, Jesus ain't just about where you're going to spend your eternal life. 
is not just fire insurance. Jesus is Lord. And He wants to relate to you in the most intimate of your relationships, your household, as Lord. Is Jesus Lord over your household? Is He Lord? Are there areas of your household that you've excluded from His Lordship? For whatever reason, husbands, wives, is your marriage under the Lordship of Christ? Husbands, are you looking to your head, Christ, to teach you how you're supposed to relate to your wife? Wives, are you looking to your head, Christ, to empower you to submit to your husband and and build him up and help him become everything God said he was supposed to be children? Are you obeying your parents because you're looking to the Lordship of Christ and you realize you've got a master in heaven and therefore you've got to submit to your parents because that's right? That's what the Scripture said. It's right. Is your household under the Lordship of Christ? I can't think of a better time than now to bring it under that covering. Would y'all stand? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come on down front. And This morning, I just want to invite you, if you need prayer, you know, whole families, just come up here to this altar and just give your family to the Lord. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made or where you're at right now. All that matters is right now, this moment, Jesus Christ can change things in your household. He can change things. But He cannot change or cannot work in what you will not submit to Him. He's not going to to come and bully His way through your house. It's always the path of humility and submission that invites the anointing of God over our lives and brings transformation. Some of you might be in a position where one of you in the household wants to submit, but there's another one that doesn't. Instead of getting angry with them, you pray for them. You pray for that husband or that wife or that child who doesn't want to submit to the Lordship of Christ. You pray and you don't give up. You keep praying. And as for you, you serve the Lord. You know, the Scripture says that the uh, the unbelieving partner might be won by your good conduct. No one's going to be won to Christ if we have have, have a hostility between us. So you serve the Lord. You serve with an intensity. You follow the Lordship of Christ and let your good conduct win that unbelieving spouse. That's what the Word of God says. Wherever you are today, submit to the Lordship of Christ. Invite Christ into your home. You can't fix what's broken, but Christ can. Amen? As we pray, invite Jesus in. Father, I just pray right now that you'd have your way. We pray this in Jesus' name.